you have constantly used the word particle. So I'm going to ask you a potentially silly question. I'm a five-year-old. I can take these liberties. What is a particle? Not a silly question <laughs> at all, as you are well aware. Uh, you know, the problem with explaining physics, this is a key issue in writing a book about the subject, is that the first thing that gets in your way is language. And this is not only true for physicists trying to communicate with non-scientists, but it's a problem for physicists communicating with each other and even with themselves. And we are often subject, even as professionals, to not exactly misleading ourselves in a, in, a, in a way that would affect the way we do physics, but misleading ourselves in a way that we think about the physics by the words that we use. And sometimes those words really get in the way. And the word particle is a particularly problematic one because like many words that we use in physics, it is a word that comes from an existing language, in this case, English for us. And, um, and it also exists in many other languages that use it, um, particule in French, for example. And the, the problem is that word comes with a lot of baggage. And what is that baggage? Well, when you think about a particle, normally you think about, let's say, a grain of sand or a particle of dust floating in the air. That's the concept. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little localized thing, like a tiny little ball. And so elementary particle, you now think in your head, you picture a tiny little ball, smaller than, smaller than you can imagine, but, 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 it's, a, but it's a little ball. Yeah. Or maybe you even imagine it going down to infinitely small size where it becomes a point. And physicists will talk about a point particle, meaning something like that. The problem is that there's a lot of things that electrons do, which, those, which, which this image of particle does not capture. And some of those things are absolutely critical. So, for example, if I took a box and I put a particle in it, what's it going to do? Well, I don't know. The particle will go somewhere. Probably if there's gravity, it'll go to the bottom of the box. If there's no gravity. It'll just float around in the box somewhere. and. Um, that's it. And there's not much to say. But if I put an electron in a box, it, in a sense, fills the whole box. And it vibrates while it's there, which is a very different thing. So, so why are we calling an electron a particle if it does things like, you know, expand to fill an entire box that it's placed in and, 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 and it's, it's there vibrating? It's somehow the wrong starting point. So you can ask yourself, well, how did it happen that electrons were called particles in the first place? Well, it's because the first manifestation of electrons that was discovered was something called uh, a cathode ray. Uh, it's a beam of electrons we know today, but they didn't know. They just had some thing that traveled in a straight line and made, made a spot on a screen and and okay, so and 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 you could make that spot small, so these things weren't you know spread out the you know across the entire apparatus. So there's this narrow beam of stuff you don't know what it is, and eventually people realize that ah that beam is made from lots and lots of objects which are all the same. They all have the same mass and electric charge, and we'll give them a name. We'll call them electrons. And so if you see a bunch of objects that travel in a beam, what's your natural thought? Well, if I have a bunch of things traveling in a beam, it's probably a bunch of particles going in a straight line. Reasonable thought. Now, on the other hand, we've all played with laser pointers, and laser pointers are narrow beams of light, but those are waves of light. So it's not instantly obvious just because you have something traveling in a beam that it's little dots traveling in a beam. Yep. And uh, on the other hand, when in, in the 19th century, one would have said that light is just a continuous wave, so you wouldn't have talked about particles in that context. So the notion very early on was that, okay, there's these electrons which travel, which, which are particle-like and travel in, in, in straight lines. And then you have electromagnetic waves, which are light, which had already been discovered and understood in the, in the middle of the 19th century. And then in 1905, Einstein came along and said, yeah, but you can't explain this thing called the photoelectric effect unless light comes in packets. Quanta, as he called them. 
And so this is the birth of the quantum idea. And this is where waves and particles start to come into contact and into conflict as ideas. Previously, it was easy. Atoms were particles. Maybe they were made of smaller things, but in any case, they were particle-like. Electrons were particles. Light was a, was a wave. And now Einstein says, yeah, but something about light is particle-like. Now, this was a proposal that would explain an experiment. And a lot of people didn't believe him for good reason, because light shows interference. If you pass light through two slits or through a diffraction grating, you'll see all sorts of crazy interference patterns. And we're used to the idea that all waves show interference. Water waves show interference as well. Yep. So people already knew from the 19th century that light was a wave. And so here, what, what Einstein was telling them that, you know, this young, young kid, let's remember, he was in his 20s, is proposing that light is made somehow of packets. It makes no sense. You're not going to have an interference pattern. But he was right. And we are still grappling with the fact that he was right, that somehow light can exhibit both interference and particle-like behavior, which does not mean, you notice I was careful to say particle-like, it does not mean light is made of little dots. But it, it, it is true that light is made from something called photons, which physicists tend to call particles but they're only particle-like in certain senses. And they have this other strange feature that like electrons, you put photons in a box, they will fill the box and they will vibrate. In fact, that's how lasers basically work. And so, you know, you have a little, little ruby crystal and the light is in there vibrating and, and, and forming a standing wave inside the ruby. So this conflict that goes back to the beginning of the 20th century between the words we use and the concepts we use, and the behaviors of these objects has caused significant confusion in physics classrooms and in books about physics for the public. And I would dare say it even causes confusion among some professional physicists too, those who, who don't have to deal with the concepts on a sort of regular basis. But for those of us who work in particle physics on the theoretical side, who have to become experts in quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is very clear about this. It is not true that electrons are particles of one type and photons are some other thing. Photons and electrons are treated on the same footing. And so whatever is true about photons, whatever wave-like properties photons have, and whatever particle-like properties electrons have, well, they both have them. And the difference between them is one we can talk about in, in a little bit, but the fundamentals of quantum field theory treat them on the same footing. 